Chunk 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 Hello everybody and welcome to another edition of Practical MDO with me, John Yasin. Today we're talking about types of gradient-free optimizers. There are many different types of gradient-free optimizers, a ridiculous number, frankly. We're going to talk about just a few of them and kind of some broad categories and when they might be useful today. The best method to use really depends on your problem formulation, how multimodal or discrete your design space is, and a multitude of other factors. I'll just introduce some different types of gradient-free optimizers today. This has to do with the optimization subcategory in this course. Before we get too deep into any one method or type of method, I want to share a table from the Engineering Design Optimization book by Martins and Ning. Here it kind of shows a breakdown of a few common gradient-free methods and shows if they're local or global methods, if they're based on a kind of math background or a heuristic, and a few other things. These are all based on the optimization algorithm classifications introduced in the first chapter of this book. So if you've already read that first chapter, this kind of touches on a few of those points. This is only to show there are many different gradient-free options, and this is certainly not an exhaustive list. But let's jump into one popular type. First, let's talk about genetic algorithms. Now, when you hear the name genetic algorithm, you might be thinking, whoa, is this based on DNA? Eh, sort of. Let's talk about it. So each point in the design space is represented by a certain combination of genes and chromosomes. Now, you might have a population of design points, for example, say 20 in your population. This means that you have a, a smattering of design variables that are different between different members of this population. Now, please bear with me. A lot of this is metaphorical, but we will get to what this means for your design optimization. Now, the whole idea here is that the optimizer will look at these different design points and say, oh, this is the best one with the, the lowest function value, the lowest objective value. I will use this. I will cross-populate it and cross-pollinate it with other designs. The idea is that this follows the notion of kind of evolution, if you will, this genetic algorithm. It follows like natural evolution patterns. Of course, you'd want the, the best answers to be used to seed the next population of these other answers. Now, I'd like to acknowledge something. Although this is nature-inspired, uh, natural evolution takes a long time in the real world. I don't know how long it took for lizards to come out of the sea and grow legs and walk and not have gills anymore, but it took a long time, right? So when you say, hey, uh, it's bio-inspired, this should be great for, for optimization, it's not necessarily the fastest method. But what's really neat about genetic algorithms is they, they usually do a good job of kind of sampling the design space in a global way. Additionally, genetic algorithms, by their definition, are able to handle discrete or integer-based design variables. So let me just show, uh, you know, I, I could explain this, but the book does a great job of explaining what a genetic algorithm is. Let, let me just show what it looks like. So here we have a very bumpy multimodal problem that I've shown in other lessons, and I will show it throughout this lesson. Here we start with 20 points in the population size. These points are all over the design space. When we say genetic algorithm, go. In this case, we're using the simple genetic algorithm in OpenMDAO. And so now it's, it's kind of perturbing these points, it's swapping data, it's swapping these bits, genes, and chromosomes, and it's converging on a, on a local minimum. Here we see, if we remember, the actual global minimum is in the bottom left-hand corner, but the genetic algorithm finds a local minimum. And you can see it's kind of perturbing these two design variables, X and Y, and trying to see, okay, can I do better? No, I, I think this is the best that I see. So that's one example of how a genetic algorithm kind of operates. You can imagine there are a bunch of points, they, they create the next generation of offspring, and, and these new points are then used in an iterative process to find the, the best answer. I went to a recent workshop, and there were so many people from industry, especially, using genetic algorithms. It's really a popular choice if you don't have efficient gradients. Additionally, if you have relatively few numbers of design variables, it might make sense to use a genetic algorithm. However, the moment you get to 10 plus design variables, it quickly becomes intractable due to how large the design space is. A lot of gradient-free methods suffer from this. Let's go on to another large classification type of gradient-free methods. Here's one called particle swarm method. You might look at this and say, whoa, swarm like this? And yes, it is sort of like that. Let's talk about it. Here, imagine you have a bunch of designs, and each one of these designs, kind of think of it as an insect or like a, a mosquito or something. And these designs exist in the design space, and not only do they have a position associated with them, they have a velocity associated with them, just like real insects. And the whole idea here is that if you have a swarm of particles and they're moving around in the design space, you want to be able to find the optimal answer by using some knowledge that the entire swarm has more than the individual design points. 
So this is a snippet from Engineering Design Optimization, the same textbook. And we have a bunch of points and they all have velocities. The, the velocities are shown with kind of the length of the lines here. They're moving around the space and we kind of see them settle in after a few iterations into a local minimum. Again, this, this distinctly follows nature. You can think about a swarm of particles and say, hey, that sounds pretty cool. I could see them kind of going through the design space and doing a good job of exploring it. It's not necessarily based from like a mathematical definitive viewpoint of optimization, but there is an inherent math behind it. And again, the book presents that math. But I just want to show you some example, you know, particle swarm convergence. Let's revisit this bumpy problem here. Now we have you know, 20 insects in this swarm. They're moving around. It looks kind of like the genetic algorithm. Maybe it's a little bit more random in, in some of the motion. Um, and, it, and it's settling in on a local optimum again. We see, okay, a, a, lot of the, a lot of the bugs or the design points are, are settling in in this lower right-hand corner. Good for them. Again, there's a lot of stochasticity in this. There's not a definitive best answer. The definition for convergence here is not necessarily as well-defined as some gradient-based methods. And this is kind of an interesting subpoint for this problem. It kind of rides the bottom here before settling into this, this smaller value here, this, this kind of basin. And you can see how many iterations this is taking and know that if for each generation, we have 20 points in the design space, that's 20 times the number of iterations function calls to your model. So that could easily become a, a pretty huge number. This is neat. I didn't realize how long it would be when I was watching this. I'm watching it live for the first time now. Isn't that exciting? Now let's go on to other methods here. And I say other methods because there are just so many. I'm not going to classify them in a certain way, but there are so many different gradient-free methods. There are ones that approximate gradient-based ones. There are ones that are kind of based on like a geometric understanding of the design space. They fold over triangles. These are called simplex methods. And then there are just so many bio-inspired nature ones. People love talking about those because, hey, that's a popular topic, right? We can look at the flapping of birds' wings. We can look at the evolution of a population and see how that changes over time. But I'm not going to say there are too many. There are a lot of them. There are a lot of gradient-free methods that are bio-inspired. Here, let me show you a, a Kobayla. This is a popular method that is sort of like the gradient-based SLSQP method, but it handles a kind of discontinuous design spaces a little bit better. So now I personally had success using Kobayla for some floating wind turbine design optimizations. Here, it was able to navigate through the kind of noisy and discontinuous space a little bit better than a gradient-based method. Now, again, it closely follows some gradient-based methods. It actually perturbs some design variables to approximate the Jacobian, just like a gradient-based method would to approximate the Hessian, but it doesn't require derivative information. Another method in this kind of other category is the simplex method. Here we have the idea of a, a triangle of design points, and, and based on which value is the highest or lowest, you either reflect this triangle to find the next design point, you expand it, or you contract it. You can imagine you can kind of like nest these triangles together, they're flipping over each other, and eventually we're contracting and contracting into a local minimum. Again, the engineering design optimization textbook has an example of how the simplex method evolves. We start with a kind of triangle here, it's reflected and expanded, and then we slowly converge through this kind of like series of triangles to the optimal design point. It's kind of neat to think about visually, right? Another method in this other category is the direct method. Direct is an acronym for dividing rectangles, something. I don't know, but check it out in the book. But the whole idea here is that you have a design space. You draw a box here, a rectangle, and you query the function here. Then you divide this into different rectangles and you query the functions here. Then based on which one is the lowest value, the best value for your design, you then break up that rectangle and search within there. It's very easy to see this in two dimensions, but it extends to n hyperdimensions. Here you can see again from this textbook kind of a, a sample of how all these rectangles are being divided and, and we might slowly converge on an optimum. This is kind of a fun example here. We have bigger rectangles, then it slowly converges and it gets smaller and smaller rectangles as we get towards the local minimum. So I drew a lot here from the, the engineering design optimization textbook only because it does such a good job of presenting some of these gradient-free methods. It has nice pictures too. Additionally, for this actual lesson, I don't need to show you too much about all of these because, again, this course is really focused on the gradient-based multidisciplinary design optimization. So although I want to explain gradient-free methods, when you should use them, and, and some types of them out there, it certainly isn't the main focus of this course. Maybe the main takeaway from this is here's a smattering of gradient-free methods. If you need to use one, check out the details, check on the math, see which one's good for you. Um, if you get into like a huge number of design variables, 
I wouldn't suggest using any of these, frankly. But if you have a, a relatively few number of design variables or a very kind of discontinuous design space, it might make sense to use one of these. As always, please like and subscribe, and thank you for watching. Guys, gals, and non-binary pals, take care. Bye.